Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Star Wars The Bad Batch Season 3 Episode 4, A Different Approach. Let's go through this episode scene by scene for all the animation Easter eggs and Star Wars slash Lucasfilm Amblin connections that you might have missed. So Omega and Crosshair are piloting the stolen Imperial shuttle away from Tantis, picking back up where we left off with them from last episode, and things are so bad that they are leaving a smoke trail in hyperspace, and I don't know if we've seen that before. You know the Purgle don't appreciate that kind of pollution. On Crosshair's screen, the Orbesh translates to power and then a yellow warning box caution caution and to make the chaos worse it looks like batcher the lurker hound is chasing crosshair around the shuttle growling and snapping i love how she blames crosshair for all of this it's kind of like my dog darla barking at me when they test the fire alarm in my building but this sets up a nice little arc for crosshair and batcher because by the end of this episode crosshair and this hound totally become friends again and it's one step on the way to crosshair becoming friends with the rest of the actual batch so they crash land safely and we know from these cool little puffs of of breath that it is chilly here. I just appreciate a Star Wars setting where they can show that it is cold without it being an ice covered tundra. We later hear from Captain Man that either this planet or the city or both are named Lau, L-A-U. Now there is no L-A-U Lau elsewhere in Star Wars, but there is an L-A-O Lau. Past season of Bad Batch, there was a club Lau Che, which was a great reference to Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom when Indy came across a Lau Che in Club Obi-Wan. Omega wants to go back to Tantus for the other prisoners, but Crosshair says, no, we definitely aren't done with the Tantus location this season. You know they're going to be headed back there at some point. Meanwhile, Hemlock questions Nala say on Tantus, he is suspicious that after months of samples from Omega, the one sample tested by someone else, Dr. Carr, came back positive. Nala says like, hey, false positives are a thing and attributes the results to Omega being an aberration herself. But notice how Hemlock, once again, has hand tremors. You may have noticed these last season. This hand could be a cybernetic replacement, like after a hand was chopped off, maybe from a failure to the Emperor, or to Vader or to some Inquisitor, but we should point out that Crosshair also had some hand tremors in the first three episodes. So these tremors could be connected. They might come from some experimentation that both Hemlock went through and put Crosshair through. We should also remember that Hemlock was immune to that sleep gas in the past due to some experiments that he went through. Maybe the hand tremors could be connected to that. We leave Nalase in her prison cell framed through the hexagon shaped hole. Don't freak out, hexagons are everywhere in nature. But the panels of the Death Star that are built in the Narkina five prison are in the shape of hexagons and there are six nodes on the imperial crest so as the camera pulls back on Nala Se, the hexagon tightens around her could be like the empire tightening its grip on Nala Se. okay meanwhile back on the other planet we get an establishing shot of the spaceport town with two round holes for shuttles to depart and touch down mud track streets snake through all these buildings and there's a shot of some laundry on a clothesline that omega will swipe later these clothes must be cold now some of the stormtroopers are wearing these big boxy duster coats and one of these with the coat looks like the side of his helmet might be cracked a little bit. We actually see this guy in the lookout tower later has a pretty horrible death. And I just like these details of them wearing coats over their armor. It shows how already Imperial occupation is just kind of strained and reliant on equipment and clothes taken from the locals, which makes corrupt practices like bribery almost a given. This is why Omega knows that she'll be able to bribe their way onto the transport. We see a green astromech droid rolling around this marketplace doing some produce shopping, trying to figure out which is the ripest. I love it. They steal some clothes and Omega ends up wearing a hat very similar to the one she wore in the season two poster. She somehow always finds her way back to these big round helmets with little brims on them. You can see this triangle shaped padding on the clothing both Omega and Crosshair are wearing. This is a design motif for cold weather clothing we've seen in Star Wars before, notably on the armor worn by the rebels on Hoth. This gate officer charges 30,000 credits, which is way more than the 15,000 Obi-Wan Kenobi promised Han Solo for both him and Luke and the Mos Eisley Cantina, or the 17 thousand Han got paid by the Rebel Alliance. In that instance, arguably the stakes were way higher and they required Han himself to pilot his own ship. This gate officer is just like, Hey, I'm just a middleman paid to look the other way. 30,000! This gate officer is greedy. But I do like how the voice gets less modulated by the mask, going from a voice that sounded like Tay Hao. Remember the Namorian flight officer for the Trade Federation battleship in Phantom Menace? But that modulation goes away and we just hear the greedy voice beneath start to come through. Are you insinuating that I should take a bribe? Meanwhile, this kid is selling kachu kachu fruit for half price. I'm pretty sure this is a new fruit to Star Wars universe, but it does look a lot like the Maelorun fruit. Anyway, keep an eye on this kid because after Omega and Crosshair discuss a way to quickly earn a whole bunch of credits, this kid's ears perk right up. I think I know how we can make some fast credits. Of 
course you do. Thank you to Harry's for sponsoring this video. It's hard to forget when you're online all the time that sometimes it's actually easier to buy things in a store. You can see before you buy it, and then when you buy it, there's no wait. And if you have itchy stubble, you're not gonna wanna wait to get your hands on a Harry's razor. And it's not like you gotta make a special trip. Harry's is available where you shop. They're at Target, Walmart, Costco, grocery stores, drug stores. You can get the exact Harry's razor that's right for you. Whether that's the two-tone ergonomic trimming handle or the new craft handle with the dotted rubberized grip or the Winston handle, which GQ called the best men's razor overall. It has a smooth zinc body with a rubberized grip and the signature Harry's five blade razor cartridge gives you total control over your shave. Plus, if you just need shaving cream or the post shave balm or new cartridges, they'll be in the same aisle. Make sure you check out Harry's next time you're out running errands and let us know what you pick up. Omega gambles against a Trandoshan in a game of Sabak. She tells Crosshair that she has gambled before, which seems like it's a reference to season one, episode 10, Common Ground, where she plays Dejaric. Then a chubby Imperial captain struts in. In the credits, this is Captain Man, and he is voiced by Harry Lloyd, aka Viserys Targaryen in season one of Game of Thrones and a number of other roles. And I just love seeing a fat officer. Reminds me of Cassian Andor's description of Imperials as fat and satisfied. His chinless appearance makes him look even less human than the other character designs on this show. And I think that's the intent Kind of looks like an egg-shaped Russian doll painted to look human. He twiddles a gold credit in his fingers and he takes a bribe from the bartender and then challenges Omega to a game. Reminding me of that scene in Inglorious Bastards where the German major Dieter Hellstrom joins them in that card guessing game from the other side of the tavern. The fact that it's Omega going up against him and he's just so smug lecturing her about how she misunderstood her enemy. I'm also reminded of the various chess matches in the Anya Taylor Joy series, The Queen's Gambit. But as they play, Batcher begins to growl. You don't seem to like me. She's harmless. Hmm. Thatcher only reacts when the captain picked up this card, and I wonder if this hound was actually signaling to Omega what the captain had drawn. Omega wins this match with the three Eastern Stars move, and we definitely saw her holding that rightmost yellow sun card in the match with the Trandoshan, so I'm wondering if she wins by having these winning cards up her sleeve, and maybe Captain Man lets her get away with it because he was cheating too, and that's why Thatcher growled? Or hey, maybe I'm overthinking it and Omega's just good at these games and I need to let it go. But Omega wins 20,000 from Captain Man, and then he demands a fine of 10,000, leaving her with 35,000. Assuming they were gambling head to head, like, you know, you wouldn't head to head Texas Hold'em, that last 20,000 credit pot would have been 10,000 of Omega's bids and 10,000 of Man's bids. So really, he just fined her to get his 10,000 back from that last hand. What a punk. So we learned Batcher had been taken by Man and the Kachu Kachu Kid demands 5,000 to tell him where she went. Crosshair wants to leave Batcher behind, but Omega insists mirroring her desire to go back to Tantus to rescue prisoners. On the loading docks, various animal crates are being loaded, marked with Orbesh signs, caution, volatile contents. Listen closely when this one gets lifted. Ah, I'm pretty sure that's a screech of the porg. Yeah, I think all of these animals in these crates are fauna that we've seen before. Like those are definitely Nuna on the left and the right in this shot. Omega finally lets Crosshair do things his way. So, so much for the title of this episode. And we end up in a shootout. Crosshair's first shot goes way over the captain's head. And later you can see Crosshair clutching his hand. So you know that he's mad he's missed. The hand tremors are affecting him still and he's becoming less of a marksman. So the one thing that made him Crosshair is starting to melt away from his cold identity. Omega hacks into the mainframe and we see on the screen an orb unlocking all cargo. Now these galloping creatures remind me of the stampeding Gallimimus in Jurassic Park. Captain Man getting pulled into the crate reminds me of the raptor crate opening attack in that same film. Shoot! -a! But I am thinking this tentacled creature could be the Rathtar from Force Awakens. Okay, here's a theory. We never learned what these animals are doing here. Could just be Lao's no pet policy, but that's a lot of pets and these are some exotic animals. But remember, Hemlock is also working on some other large scale organic project that's not Project Necromancer and the Emperor was like, I have a need for that too. We also know from episode two that the Empire created these genetically engineered slither vines. So maybe this right here was a shipment for animals for Hemlock to experiment on. And that could be why there is already an Imperial presence here on Lao. Maybe the Empire is trying to play like InGen in Jurassic Park and use frog DNA and dino DNA to resurrect something like, oh, I don't know, a Mandalorian mythosaur. Project Necromancer was discussed on the planet Mandalore in Moff Gideon's base in Mandalorian season three, years into the future beyond this. And Gideon had a bunch of clones of himself there. I don't know, maybe there's something else going on when the Empire bombed and purged Landon of Mandalore. Omega and Crosshair escape, and this cloaked stormtrooper that was on the watchtower now stands up at just the worst possible second to get caught in the engine blast. 
the shriek he emits. Had he just stayed crouched down, he could have avoided this. So the episode ends with the Bad Batch reuniting on this lunar surface with the sickest view of these two red planets. Reminds me of the view from the planet Fresno in Andor episode six, where Cassian killed future MCU Ben Grimm the Thing, Arvel Skeen, played by Evan Moss Backrack. Omega and Wrecker hug, both of them wiping away tears. And Wrecker says that they crossed the galaxy four times, but Hunter corrects five. And I don't know about you, but just hearing a clone say five, I'm just reminded of fives. I miss fives. Then Crosshair steps on the ship. The music is Kevin Kiner's amazing composition, Crosshair's theme. We've heard this melody in a few other episodes, like at the end of the amazing Outpost episode. And I love this shot from the side, showing this wide gulf that separates the stolen ship from the Bad Batch ship with the starscape in the background. A starscape gulf that Omega and Wrecker have no problem crossing to hug, but now it seems like the widest distance possible between these sides of the team. Hunter and Wrecker can only glare at Crosshair in anger, and only Omega begins to step forward timidly. Yes, there's a lot of catching up to do, and a lot to talk about. A huge thanks to Noah Chen for helping me write this episode breakdown script. Subscribe to all three channels of the New Rockstars Network. I'm Eric Voss. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.